This place, this fabulous place, when you can look at it live, it's, it's beautiful. You know, next time when you have the opportunity to come at the new college, visit the Rainy Hall, it's beautiful. And all to the scholars, teachers, educators, students who make lives here in this place, the changing between people about religion, education, about how we look at each other in this society. There is no other word today to you than to say thank you for your hard work in this difficult and hard time while trying to get to the other side of our lives because the exercise we're doing with this pandemic, what we're doing with the crisis as human, when we look at the way we look at each other, it's another birth coming to us and we need to be ready to go to this new life that awaiting us, which I hope will be the life of gratitude, love, and respect. That is what I want to see that University of Edinburgh through our scholars and teachers and professors, those who think in the best way to enrich our society, to be more tolerant, to work in terms of dialogue, and to see this world as a place that any mankind can be welcome in the deepest respect and the deepest way to consider ourselves as people. So my word is very simple to all of that you know, teachers in this place, study in this place, was here before and continue to teach around the world. Thank you and happy anniversary. Thank you very much. He's a professor of natural science and theology here at New College. He's going to talk to us about religion and science at New College, a tradition of what Just waiting for my slides. celebrate the 175th anniversary and I'm going to take you back to, well actually through many of the 175 years and slightly before it. So the relationship between science and religion, religion and science, um, this, I often say this at the beginning of talks, and I think it can't be said often enough, this is one of the defining debates of our times and it's impossible not to hold an opinion on it. You want to understand secular culture is, how it works, what it values, then you can't avoid grappling with the science and religion debate. Over the last couple of years, New College has become a world leader in this area. Most obviously at the postgraduate level, where we teach three specialist programs, masters and PhD level, and we currently have about 50 students enrolled in these specialist programs, and as far as I know, that far exceeds any other comparable institution in the world. So that's quite a nice tick to have on our CV, if you like. Um, we've also been very successful at winning research funds as well. Um, we currently hold a £2.4 million grant from the John Templeton Foundation for our God and the Book of Nature project. And we give 10 universities collaboratively in that. So that's another big tick in our CV. So, science and religion has been a, a, you know, a success story in New College recently. Only recently though, you might ask, those who know something of our history will be aware that actually science and religion, religion and science, 
goes back to the very beginning of New College. For not only was the interaction between theology and the new natural sciences an important area of concern when New College was founded in the 1840s, but its chair in natural science, which was created at the time, was probably the world's very first academic post aimed at addressing this debate between science and religion. Interestingly, evolution was the, the kind of the hot topic then, as it is in many ways now as well. Um, evolution, origins of life, these were at the centre of the science and religion debate in the 1840s, as they still are. And the holders of the chair in natural science all made significant contributions to the way that evolution was received. So what I'll do in the next sort of 25 minutes or so, I'll spend that time exploring the history of New College's chair in natural science and the way it evolved, because it had a very important effect on the way that evolution was received theologically, but also scientifically at the time. You may not be able to see the writing on this, um, I'll take you through it in a moment. So although science and religion is flourishing today at New College, the endowed chair that I'm going to talk about is sadly no longer. As the New College history itself makes clear with this wonderful little plate which is headed at the top, professors of chairs are now extinct. <laughs> and these three fine fellows, they are John Fleming, John Duns and James Young Simpson, they were the three successive holders of the chair in natural science, and each of them had strong views on evolution, which dominated their writing and their teaching while they were in post. Now, these weren't the kind of views that you might expect, though, because the noisy creation evolution debate that we know today is actually a relatively recent innovation that stems largely from the 1920s onwards, by which time the chair had nearly run its course by then. And I, ex I expect that would have amazed the three holders of this chair, they all had sound scientific pedigrees, I think it would have amazed them to see the debate between creation and evolution or evolution and theology presented in st such stark terms as either you believe in the Bible or you believe in mainstream science. For these people, the issues were much, much more subtle, and you'll find that each of them develops their individual position on evolution at key stages in the historical development of evolution as a scientific idea. And it, it, it's great actually because their thinking illustrates very clearly the ways that scientists were receiving the new developments in evolution as much as theologians were receiving these ideas. Now, my timeline here, which I hope you can read, um, serves as a summary of my talk. Right from the foundation of the New College, soon after the disruption, there was a firm conviction that students should receive a broad education. So there were chairs in logic, moral philosophy established, and distinctively, a chair in natural science. And all of this before the college had even been built in stone. And here we come to the figure of John Fleming, uh, three lines down in my timeline. He was the first holder of the chair. He operated during the controversy surrounding the early evolutionary book, second line down, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, published in 1844. So please just remember that in your head for a moment. Vestiges, 1844, because I will come back to that. Fleming didn't live to see Darwin's Origin of Species, 1859, uh, Paul Isaiah now, but his successor, John Duns, played a full part in the Origin of Species debates. By the time we come to the third holder of the chair, James Young Simpson, Darwin had actually become rather unfashionable in evolutionary science, and that's the phase that's often called the eclipse of Darwinism roughly about 1880 to roughly 1930s, and that's when Simpson is operating. And it wasn't until the 1930s or 40s, a phase called the new synthesis, that natural selection becomes centre stage again in the science. And this is where Darwin was dramatically vindicated by new discoveries in genetics. 
Anyway, Simpson, who is working in the Eclipse era, has a totally different way of working with the science compared with his predecessors, Fleming and Dunn. They're all very, very different, partly because the science is very, very different. Well, after Simpson's death in 1934, the chair becomes extinct. But that isn't the end of the story, because I want to mention, towards the end, and really only in passing, one of our more recent principals, whom I'm sure many people here will remember, uh, Ruth Page, who made a, create, a very creative response to evolution in her 1996 book, God and the Web of Creation. I'll say a little bit about that. Back to the beginning. Evolution wasn't a new idea in the 1840s. For one thing, a French, national, a French naturalist, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, please remember his name, Lamarck, um, he proposed an evolutionary theory back in the early 1800s, but it wasn't well supported in Britain. Most scientists here rejected it on the grounds that it constituted unbelief, atheism, and materialism. Instead, British scientists in the early 1800s tended to be committed to some kind of belief in special creation. So this is where each species appeared fully formed in the geological record, not having developed, certainly not having, having been developed from previous species, but having been designed as such by God. And in this, these scientists believed that they were following the evidence of the fossil record. In other words, the widespread British belief in the special creation of new species was held on scientific grounds as much as theological. Well, remember I said to um, have in your head this title, Vestiges, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. Into this situation, Vestiges was published anonymously in Edinburgh in 1844, and this was completely lapped up by the British public, who were fascinated by this new idea, but it was lambasted by prominent scientists on the other hand, absolutely creating a sensation in the early 1840s. And what Vestiges does, it, it makes a comparison with Newton's laws of motion, which control all of inorganic matter, if you like, and it proposes a similarly grand principle, which, which, which he calls development, we would call it evolution now, development to control the organic world, life in other words. In other words. So together, Vestiges proposes these two principles, gravitation, and development, and these can explain the growth of the universe, stars, planets, and the progress of life on Earth, towards increasing complexity and the development of humans as the pinnacle of creation. Well, Vestiges did have some natural theology in it. It made many references to the divine author of creation, but it was pretty obviously quite naturalistic in comparison to what had come before. Well, in the newly born free church, the vestiges it creates anxiety to such an extent that when the General Assembly of 1845 discusses the curriculum of New College, there's a strong feeling that future ministers need to know about this stuff. So the decision is taken to establish a chair in natural science at New College, and Chalmers appoints a real scientific heavyweight at the time, John Fleming. And he's one of the, the foremost paleontologists of his day, and he also happens to be a free church minister. Here he is. Fleming is 60 years old when he begins work at New College, and sadly he seems to publish relatively little now in this sort of later stage of his life, or at least compared with his prodigious output when he was parish minister, uh, including works like his Philosophy of Zoology in 1822, his Encyclopedic History of British Animals in 1828, and a very famous little paper in 1826, which poured score on those who were trying to interpret the Earth's geology in terms of Noah's Flood. He scorned all of this. What we do have from his last phase is his posthumous work, Lithology of Edinburgh, so the Rocks of Edinburgh, in other words. Um, and several accounts of his courses in natural science at New College. These are really fascinating. Um, it's amazing to see what he teaches the training ministers. It's state-of-the-art science, really. There's no physics, sadly, but there's plenty of mineralogy, chemistry, biology, and geology. And as
as you might expect, Vestiges, that controversial book, comes in for special attack in Fleming's lectures, along with other evolutionary works. And Fleming regards all of these things alike as crude generalizations from imperfect or misunderstood data, fostering errors of a very dangerous kind, visionary and loathsome materialism. This is what he says of it. Well, today we might regard that kind of conviction as a sign of Fleming's personal theological agenda. But in his day, Fleming thinks he's actually speaking as a scientist. He's interpreting the evidence, the fossil record, in other words. He's, he's speaking of science as a scientist, letting the evidence speaking, speak for itself without introducing unnecessary theological or philosophical glosses. On the relatively few occasions when he does kind of consciously introduce theological glosses, he assumes that the science should point to divine purpose in nature, uh, material evidence that life was deliberately designed and didn't evolve naturalistically. And as I've already said, in all of this, Fleming is typical of many British scientists of his time. He's so steeped in natural theology that he can't tell it apart from the science, or so we might conclude today. But all that's to change with Darwin's publication of Origin of Species, just two years after Fleming's death. Well, by the time Fleming died, vestiges had been out for 13 years, and evolution was no longer such a fresh challenge. In fact, questions arose as to whether it was time to abandon the teaching of science at New College. There was no clear agreement, though, other than that Fleming had done a good job. So the compromise was reached to replace Fleming by a lecturer. Well, there were several incumbents that went, uh, went by in quick succession before John Dunn, who was Minister of Torfican, was appointed. And he actually did such a good job and stayed in for such a long time, he was eventually promoted to the full chair. Here he is, John Dunn. He is very, very different from Fleming. Like Fleming, he has a solid background in biology, but he doesn't contribute to the science as a leading researcher, as Fleming had done. Also, interestingly, Duns is very concerned to distinguish natural science and theology from each other, and that makes Duns sound significantly more modern than Fleming, because we now find that we need to speak, Duns speaks of a relationship between science and theology, sometimes in harmony, sometimes a conflict, but not of identity. Another distinctive move that Duns makes in comparison with Fleming is that he introduces the militaristic metaphors that are so typical of the kind of conflict idea between science and religion that we know well. And Duns tells his trainee ministers that they need to understand science in order to fight the false friends of the church who have already grasped these weapons of science. Why this sharpening of categories and language from Fleming just a few years earlier? Well, the answer is that by now, in Darwin's time, the Darwin debates are in full swing. Well, I'll assume that you're broadly familiar with Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, but I will make the distinction with Lamarck. Remember him, the French naturalist I mentioned earlier on? His earlier system, which was so influential on that controversial book, Vestiges. Well, in Lamarck's theory of evolution, evolution is effectively a kind of a ladder of progress towards increased complexity. Individual species do evolve, but there's an overarching sense of purpose, of progress built into the scheme of life beyond the fate of each individual species as it struggles to survive. And this means that although Lamarck, Lamarckism is a naturalistic theory of evolution, it's much easier to do natural theology with it than it is with Darwinism. So it's much easier to interpret Lamarck's scheme in terms of divine purpose behind everything. Darwin, on the other hand, has no ladder of progress, no grand principles, or overall sense of progression or purpose. So if Fleming, in his day, had seen vestiges as a threat to special creation, 
while Darwin provides a far greater threat in Dunn's eyes. Well, Dunn's doesn't hold back. He publishes one of the earliest and most scathing reviews of Origin Species, criticising Darwin on both scientific and theological grounds. He says, If notoriety be any proof of successful authorship, Mr. Darwin has had his reward. And Darwin goes on to argue in this amazing review that the evidence, the scientific evidence, speaks against Darwin. Not only are there no transitional forms between species in the fossil record, but the evidence, the fossil evidence, points to permanent forms designed by the Creator, says Dunn. It's very clear, he argues, that God keeps species persistently distinct from each other. The Creator has a clear plan for life in creation, a grand scheme. Now it's interesting that if you read this, this uh, famous review by Dunn, he appears to be veering towards the earlier controversial work of vestiges. He almost sort of says, well, vestiges is kind of okay, maybe we can live with that. Um, he clearly has a preference for vestiges over origin species. And I'm going to re react to one of my favourite quotes from this review. Starting now. We believe there is good reason for affirming that everything which is false as to the scheme of life in the worthless development theory, evolution theory, is contained in origin species. And a great deal in addition, which is more mischievous and profane than anything to be met with in vestiges. Were it possible that the terrible alternative could ever be receive either the vestiges or the origin of species, we would without hesitation choose the former. Vestiges contains views less dishonouring to the Creator and less antagonistic to common sense than those met with in the origin of species, and this is affirming much. So, what he, end quotation there. Um, what he's saying basically is that vestiges might be bad, but honestly, origin of species is terrible. Um, well, this highly negative view characterises much of Dunn's later writing, and right to the end of his career at New College, Dunn's continues to attack evolution in general and Darwinism in particular. And in its place, Dunn's promotes a fairly undiluted version of special creation and design, arguing from the fossil evidence. Now, here's one of my favourite examples he uses of, of design, arguing from the fossil evidence. He asks, why do the Carboniferous rocks, and there are lots of these, and they're very plentiful in the low the Carboniferous series, they contain the coal measures, of course. And why do these rocks show abundant evidence of land plants, you know, in other words, plant fossils, but not evidence of herbivorous land animals to eat them? Why are there, there plant fossils in the Carboniferous, but not animals? After all, Dunnus says, interpreting Darwin, if evolutionary theory was correct, then when there's lots and lots of food to be eaten, then surely there should be animals eating it. Dunn has what he calls a magnificent argument in natural theology against Darwin. He says, these plants lived and died and were laid down in the carboniferous coal measures precisely so that coal would be laid down ready for humans to come along and dig it up millions of years later. The design argument succeeds where Darwin fails, things does. Now it's fair to say that Dunn's is out on a limb here because the Darwin debates, they, of course, they, they were notoriously vociferous in both, uh, on both scientific and theological grounds. But within a decade or two, most scientists had, had come round to evolution in general terms, even if Darwin's particular version continued to be controversial. And at this time, there are influential religious voices in Edinburgh, including in the Free Church, who are willing to make peace with evolution. And ironically, one of the more prominent, prominent is the principal of New College during Dunn's time, Robert Rainey, who is up there, down in the little picture there. Or Dr. Misty, as he's popularly known, owing to his readiness to concede contemporary developments rather than defend the church against them. And in Rainey's inaugural address for the 1874-75 session at New College, he does just that. He concedes that there's a lot of truth in evolution and that theology needs to do some adapting, or at least make peace with evolution. 
It's actually a very popular lecture up here. The Scots will be getting very high praise for this. I can imagine the atmosphere in the New College staff room after that, though. Um, Dunst feels no need to make such peace at all with evolution, and he continues to wage war on evolution for the next 30 years um, until he retires in 1903. At that point, again, there are debates in the church over whether, whether the, chair, the chair should be discontinued. But thankfully, one final incumbent is appointed, and that's James Young Simpson. Here he is, freshly ordained after training at New College, and he had the beginnings of an academic career in biology just before that. Simpson is completely unlike Darwin's, and unlike Fleming too, for that matter. Simpson doesn't question the legitimacy of evolutionary science, and neither does he argue over the evidence. He does something completely different. He takes evolution as a given, and he uses it as a springboard to develop his own mystical view of the cosmos and human origins. Now remember that back in my timeline, I talked about the eclipse of Darwinism before the 1930s and 40s. This is just the time when Simpson is operating in the eclipse of Darwinism phase, when evolutionary science is becoming increasingly diverse, but it isn't unif uni united, unified, behind the central body of theory. But quite simply, that's because Darwin's natural selection has gone out of fashion, and it won't return until the 1930s, when it's decisively reinforced by new advances in genetics. But in the eclipse phase, when there's no central body of theory, it's much more straightforward and metaphysical and speculative about evolution. And this is exactly what Simpson does, along with other thinkers at the time as well, exploiting teleological progress oriented accounts of evolution. Well, Simpson's first major theological work, The Spiritual Interpretation of Nature, 1912, this is saturated with the progressive view of evolution as God's preferred method of creation. And in common with some of the others at the time, Simpson believes that the emergence of mind is central, a central driving force in evolution leading to human self-consciousness as the kind of pinnacle of evolution. And he argued this way, Simpson suggests that some people with extraordinarily powerful minds, Jesus is the example he gives, might be able to control matter and energy themselves with their minds to work miracles. Also, Simpson says, the evolution of mind must point to the continued existence of our minds after death. Human immortality must be a consequence of the evolution process, he thinks, because otherwise God's constitution of humans as spiritual animals would render evolution pointless. In Simpson's most mature work, The Garment of the Living God, he sees evolutionary science as making a crucial junction with theology. Now, he says, we are on the threshold of a new natural theology where science teaches us of the manifestation of an infinite mind energy. Infinite mind energy is a key term, Simpson. It's quite hard to interpret. It seems to be some kind of mind force behind driving evolution, but at times Simpson speaks about it almost in a sort of pantheistic way. So it's completely very kind of speculative, mystical met metaphysics going on in his work there. Um, at any rate, he, he connects the the evolution is driving single-celled organisms like amoebae, for instance, with what's driving the evolution of humans, all seeking to desire union with Christ, which is the last stage of evolution on this terrestrial plane. So, so as far as he's concerned, evolution is pointing all animals towards Christ. Those of you who are familiar with um, later science and theology conversations will be familiar with um, the other shot and it's famous for that idea. Indeed, thinking it first. Well, I'm just giving you a taste here. There's much more to Simpson. Um, sadly, though, in his last years, it becomes clear that the future of the chair is looking pretty tenuous. The reason being that negotiations are underway with the university, the Merge New College, with, with the university. Um, that eventually happens in 1935, and of course, there are then plentiful resources to teach science without needing a specific chair of natural science at New College. 
So when Simpson dies in 1934, the decision is taken to axe the chair completely. So it's the end of the chair of natural science, unfortunately. Well, after the chair becomes extinct, it's decades before anyone else at Eton College commits their thoughts on natural selection to paper. You might think that the great T.F. Torrance, who was so well known for his deep interest in science, he might have had something interesting to say about evolution. No, actually, he's largely silent on, on this in his major works on theology and science. Instead, the next major assessment of evolution comes from Ruth Page in her wonderful little book of 1996, God and the Web of Creation. But this means there's a big gap in the geological record of New College here um, between Simpson in 1934 and Page in 1996, more than 60 years. Um, it's huge in the history of evolution of science as it continues to evolve. We have no missing link to explain how Simpson, with his kind of mystical, ethereal mysticism, develops into Page's very down to earth environmentalism. All we can say is that, just as with the three holders of the chair in natural science, Page's theology of evolution is shaped strongly by the concerns of her day. But by now, these are also live concerns for all of us because they are uh, the pressing environmental crisis. Well, like Simpson before her, Paige takes evolutionary biology as read, and she makes radical claims from it about the nature of God and where is evolution going, if it's going anywhere at all. In fact, she is much more Darwinian than any of her predecessors. She's the first true Darwinian in New College, I would say, actually. She's such a strikingly Darwinian. Her point is that Christian doctrines of creation are all too, all too often based on nice metaphysics from the book of Genesis, um, but they don't really take an accurate or, or honest view of nature. There was never a golden age of nature, she points out. Um, thinking through creation and God as creator, we need to engage with the science of the here and now, nasty and unpleasant as it may be. Well, this book was published in 1996. It still strikes me as fresh and innovative, especially since much of the discussion around evolution, even now in the science and theology field, still continues to sound a bit Victorian compared to Ruth Page. She's just a bit too Darwinian for many theologians, even today. I hope her time will come. <laughs> anyway, I, I need to draw to a close because my time is nearly up. I have given you actually slightly over 175 years of New College history here, thought on evolution. You can see, I hope, that this thought has evolved, as evolutionary science has evolved. That's actually a characteristic feature of the science and religion debate, um, that it evolves as the scientific issues do evolve. And we, we need to keep determining well, what, what are the non negotiables here, like science or theology? I hope that we today are still respecting this amazing um, uh, legacy that we've inherited from our predecessors. Thanks for listening.